So this is how our initial data without any partition looks. And we already know that its Gini measure is 0.5 and its entropy is 1. We could use either of these measures. Now we consider the first split. And it so happens that after evaluating all the 38 different possible splits, the best one is at a lot size of 19. Okay, and, and you can just take this for granted or, or you can sit down and perform all the calculations. But what happens is here, we end up with two sets, both of which are more homogeneous than before, nine owners, three non-owners, and three owners, nine non-owners. And we can calculate now the genie or entropy for this set and for this set. So for each of those sets, the genie and the entropy are exactly the same because they are 9393. The proportions are still the same. And therefore, and M is 2, but proportions are you know, 0 0.67, 0 0.33. So they're identical. Uh, and therefore, uh, rather it's 0 0.25, 0 0.75. So you apply the formula, you're going to get the same number for both the partitions. right? So the genie is 0 0.375, entropy is 0 0.811. So notice that this genie is less than 0 0.5 which was the value we had before. And entropy is also less than 1. So that is good. So now we've got two partitions with the Gini of 0.375, entropy of 0.811. This is just a coincidence, but these are exactly the same. In general, you may not get a split that is uh, th that gives these kind of results. But what you really want to do is now to take these two values and calculate the entropy and Gini for the whole set. Now we now have the entropy and genie for the two partitions, but we want one number to represent the entropy and genie for the entire set with the partition in place. The way to do that is to simply take, for example, if you're thinking about genie, take the weighted average genie between these two sets. What do you mean by weighted average? Well, weight the value by the number of cases which are in that set. So you've got 12 cases here, in the first partition, 12 cases in the second partition. So it turns out that the weight is going to be the same. And therefore, the genie for the entire set is simply going to now be the average of the two genies. But suppose there were 10 cases here and there were only two cases here. Of course, in this case, since the values are the same, it's always going to be the same. But you get the idea. What you want to do, if you've got a bunch of regions, each has its own genie value. To get the overall genie or to get the overall entropy, you take the weighted average of all these values with the number of cases in each region being the weight. So in our present case, the combined genie is 0.375 because they are both the same and it's a reduction from 0.5 and the combined entropy is 0.811 which is also a reduction from 1. So overall, what this partition has done is improved the homogeneity from before. That's what it has achieved. Now, how do you choose subsequent splits? Once again, you choose all the possibilities and calculate the overall genie or entropy under each and choose the best. So here, what are the possibilities? Well, the possibilities are you could choose this group, the one on top, and that you can split either on lot size or on income, right? So the income splits are still the same as before, but the lot size splits are now only for values which are above 19. So not all the splits earlier are now possible, right? So you've got some number of splits, maybe instead of 38, it is now uh, something like uh, 25. I'm just guessing. You could actually look at the data and see what it is. So there are that many splits possible there. And again, here there are lots of splits too, because this also can be split on lot size between 13 and 19 and income, the complete range. So maybe another 25. So now you have a total of 50 possible splits that you want to consider. What we really will do is to perform each of those splits and calculate the Gini value under each of them or calculate the entropy value under each of those splits and choose that split which provides the maximum reduction in impurity. That's what really we are trying to do. So there are several splits possible on this group, several splits possible on this group. Consider all the possibilities, calculate the overall genie entropy or genie or entropy under each of them. Choose the best split.
and make that split. So it so happens that that split happens to fall at this income level as we saw earlier. And finally, after performing, so we continue in that vein. And after you perform all the splits, this is what our diagram is going to look like, the set of splits, right? So the first split was here at 19. Next split was here. The next split actually was here. This created this whole pure region. And the next split was probably there and so on and so on and so on. So those are all this. This is the tree after all the splits. Now it's instructive for you to take a look at each of the rectangular regions here. Right. So for example, here's a region. Here's another region. Here's a region. Here's a region. Here's a region. Here's a region and so on. What you notice is that every region is perfect, completely homogeneous, has only owners or only non-owners, never a mix. So in this example, because of the way our data was, it was possible to get a perfect split, right? So all the groups are pure. And of course, we know how this whole thing breaks out into a tree definition. I'm not going to go over this once again. So you see the split at uh, lot size of 19 creates two groups. And then uh, we know that the number inside the node is a split value. And the number along the arcs are basically the uh, number of cases that fell along uh, on, on that branch and so on. We looked at this already. And this is how the tree looks after three different splits. And this is what the complete final tree looks like after all the splits are performed. In other words, this is what corresponds to the last diagram that we saw here, to this diagram. This was all the splits, and this is the corresponding tree that uh, the splits imply. So for example, first one, uh, income, a uh, lot size, less than 19, so that's where it is. Uh, second split here, income, 84.75, that's where it is. And the third split was uh, probably uh, this one, which is uh, uh, lot size, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's the split here, and so on. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence here between these two things. Okay, so you can see here that there is a correspondence between any leaf node and a region. So for example, this leaf node really corresponds to this region because you think about this. Uh, lot size less than 19, so that is the bottom space. Income greater than 84.75, that is this one. Okay, or to take another example, you've got this node here, which is uh, lot size less than 19, income less than 84.75, lot size less than 18. So lot size less than 19, income 84.75, lot size. So that is this particular case. And it says there are seven cases here. And sure enough, there are seven different dots here as well. Okay. So you can see there is a correspondence between uh, the regions and the leaf nodes. So it might be a good idea for you once again to think about uh, what will be the regions corresponding to these four leaf nodes that I have marked. So I've marked four different leaf nodes here. So again, what you could do is to uh, look at this, pause the video, and think about which regions of the diagram correspond to these four leaf nodes that I have marked. You, know, you could just mentally do this. Uh, just to make sure we understand. And we'll, of course, shortly see the solutions. But I would suggest you pause the video and take, take a look at that. Try to answer that. Okay. So I've put in the, uh, the numbers here. So those are the other regions. Okay. So two, let's examine just one of them. Two says, lot size greater than 19 income less than 57.15 so large size greater than 19 income less than 57.15 so it's going here and large size greater than 22.21.4 so that's what this region is right so large size greater than 19 income less than this large size greater than this so that's what this region is so in a similar fashion, you could examine that all the other things that I've marked here 
are actually corresponding to each other. So one is here, and I'm saying this is the region corresponding to that. Two is here, I'm saying this is the region corresponding to that. Three and four. Now, of course, we have achieved here 100% purity, but this may not always be a good idea. If you remember, we spoke earlier about the concept of overfitting the data, right? That is what we've got is a tree that perfectly fits the training data. And we know that this means that you could have overfitting. So beyond a point, better and better performance on the training data really means that we are fitting noise in the data. That is, we are fitting the underlying patterns, but we are also latching on to random occurrences which will then tend to reduce the performance on validation data. So here you can look at the impact of the number of splits on the error rate, right? So you've got two curves here. One of them shows the training data and the more splits you have on the training data, the lower the error rate is going to be. By error rate, we mean every partition is not homogeneous. Right? If it's not homogeneous, that means there is some error. But we know that we can keep on splitting and get an error rate which is really very low, sometimes even zero, as in our present data. Right? So on the training data, we can keep on increasing the splits and keep on improving the performance. However, because that does overfitting, when you try that on, when you try those trees on the validation data, if you select a tree which has too many splits, then your error rate on the validation data would tend to be high. So, for example, if you can consider just one tree, which is to say, classify everybody as an owner or non-owner. That is a tree with just one node, with in fact, just the root node, nothing else. One node, which is a decision node. In that case, of course, your performance on the training and validation data is going to be pretty bad. But then you consider trees uh, with more and more nodes and the error rate on both training and validation will keep on reducing. Beyond a point, as you consider more splits, the error rate on the validation data will start to increase. So ideally speaking, we want a number of splits to be corresponding to this point of the graph where we've got a good tree, but we are not overfitting. That's really what we want, okay? So even though it might be possible for us to get extremely good trees on the training data, we still don't want to get that good a tree because it's not a good idea, okay? So big trees are likely to overfit and we want to eliminate the splits that do not reduce the error rates very much, okay? Now, one case for removing that is, for example, splits that create very small groups. So here we've got a total of three cases coming in here, and then it's further splitting, okay? So these are splits. Again, here we've got a total of three cases. Here we've got a total of two cases. So these nodes already have very few cases. There's no point in further splitting them. So that's one way we could reduce the size of the tree. So, for example, take this bad split, we can eliminate it by simply combining both of these into one node. So we've got three cases here, and we just say, well, we're going to combine this into one single node. If you look back at the previous diagram, we saw that there were three cases coming in here. We split it into non-owners and owners. You had two non-owners to uh, one owner. So what we're saying is, let's combine both of these, put them into one single node, and anybody who falls there, we're going to classify them as a non-owner. Why non-owner? Because there were two non-owners and one owner in the incoming cases. So we just say, I'm not going to split it any further. I'm just going to say, anybody who satisfies these conditions, I'm going to predict as a non-owner. Of course, that increased the error rate, but reduced the number of splits. That's what we mean by pruning. That is, we've got a tree, which is now very big and giving a low, very low error rate, but we prune the tree back to eliminate some of the splits because we know that too many splits means overclassification or overfitting. Okay, so the whole process then is first you do recursive partitioning, which we just studied, and then we do the pruning using the validation data. Right. In other words, 
if you look at this diagram what this diagram implies is that we can consider trees with varying numbers of splits right that is we could consider a tree with no split could consider a tree let's say with five splits 10 splits 20 splits etc etc right so each of them is a different tree so you can really think of it as saying i've got all these possibilities for trees which one do i choose okay so what we really want to do is to use the validation data to select the best tree and that is the pruning approach that cart uses right so we want to choose the tree that is the tree that has the number of splits here corresponding to this minimum point on the performance on the validation data right so effectively what we are going to do is to create trees with varying number of nodes right so for example we are going to say what is the best tree i can have which has only two nodes or one split what is the best tree with only no, no split which is just the root node alone with one split i can split on any one of the variables but we already saw that the best tree with one split is the split at 19 what is the best tree with two splits what is the best tree with three splits in other words we create the best trees with each value for the number of splits we see how it performs on the validation data and out of all those for each number we say on the validation data the tree with five splits is the best one the best tree with five splits is is what is good or and so on okay and then we say okay because the tree with five nodes is the one that performed best on the validation data that is our final tree okay so that's really the process that we're going to use so generate the best tree for each size and select the tree with minimum error rate on the validation data out of all these trees okay so we've got the best no tree with one split two splits three splits four splits splits etc on the training data out of all of these which is the one that performs best on the validation data that's the final tree that we are going to choose so notice here that in the process of selecting the tree we are already using the validation data right so now to check the performance of this model we have to really check it on the test data we can't use the performance on the validation data as a measure of quality because we used it in the process of selecting the tree so we now have to go to the third partition the test partition and see what is the performance on that that is what is going to tell us how good the model really is okay so again just to make this things more concrete that is why is it that the uh, you know error rate keeps on increasing beyond a point right so we can say that we want to consider error rate of a tree plus also its complexity okay that is we are saying the overall quality of a tree consists of its error rate which is good you want to have low error rate but you also want to have you don't want to have too many splits or too many nodes okay so the overall cost for a particular tree is its error rate plus its complexity factor that is the number of nodes multiplied by the penalty you want to impose for complexity together they determine how good the tree is so we cannot just go by error rate alone because we might end up overfitting right so you have this complexity criterion that you add in and say the total cost is the uh, measured by its error rate plus its complexity so alpha is the penalty for the number of uh, leaf nodes and l of t is the number of leaf nodes we have so this is the total cost and this is what we are trying to minimize so when you say alpha equals zero effectively you're saying i'm not going to impose any penalty for the tree size which obviously means you will go completely by error rate and therefore you'll generate the complete tree on the training data and use it use just that whereas if you put a very high value on uh, alpha then what you're effectively saying is uh, 
even one extra node is going to make it bad. So therefore, you'll just say, well, I'm just going to have a tree with one node. So clearly, what we're looking for is a middle ground between these two. And that is really what we discussed earlier, the approach. This is the approach. Start with the full tree, increase alpha gradually till the smaller tree becomes better. Select the smaller tree as the best tree for its size. And then we see, have we reached a subtree of just one node? Then you stop. Otherwise, continue to increase alpha and so on. So this is how you get the best tree for each size, each number of splits. We won't again be doing this because Rattle will do all of this for us behind the scenes. So again, just to come back, the advantages of rules are, well, they're very transparent, easy to explain, and also for in terms of liability for insurance companies and so on, they can very clearly explain how they made the decision. So they, they don't have to appear as if they made the decision arbitrarily. They can say, well, this is the data, this is the rule we use for everybody. So it's easy to justify rules. Okay. As I've already mentioned very briefly, these trees can also be used for prediction. Currently, we use them only for classification. It can also be used for prediction. We look at this later in the course. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of using the CART technique. Lots of advantages, couple of disadvantages as well, but uh, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages and therefore this is a technique that is very widely used.